All right. I think we can get started at this point. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zaki. Um, I'm an interventional radiology fellow or independent resident at Jefferson University Hospital. Um, I'm hosting this webinar as part of the Research and Innovation Committee of the SIR RFS. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Ron Winnaker. Dr. Winnaker did his training at Jefferson uh, by Cornell and Sloan Memorial. Um, he worked briefly at um, Cornell before coming back to Jefferson, where he's Associate Professor and Director of the Venus um, Interventions. Um, in addition to being an expert and well-renowned in the world of Venus disease, Dr. Winnaker is also heavily invested in IR training education with a particular focus on using simulation as a tool for trainees to help improve their theoretical knowledge as well as technical skills with the ultimate goal of improving patient safety. Um, he runs the simulation lab at, in the IR department at Jefferson um, and has conducted research evaluating its effectiveness. He's also one of the organizers of the simulation competition at the um, SIR annual meeting which I think will also be taking place uh, this year in June at Boston. So without further ado, Ron, the floor is all yours. All right, thanks so much, Zaki. Thanks for inviting me to talk about this topic. I think um, simulation in the IR space is uh, something we don't talk about often. And, and as you'll hear as this talk goes on, um, we're probably one of the last uh, specialties in procedural medicine to jump into the world of simulation. And I think we should start to catch up with the surgeons, the endoscopists and everybody else in medicine and see how much more we can do in the simulation world. I think we're, we're really at the forefront of being able to do that. So um, hopefully this will be an interesting topic. We can answer some questions at the end and uh, kind of go through what it is that simulation is. All right, so what's the scope of the problem? I think all of us in medical school um, have heard this, and this, is, this topic has been going on for many, many years now, that basically to err is human. And the Institute of Medicine report way back, you know, probably 15, 20 years ago now, talks about building a safer health system and medical errors are responsible for a large number of patient deaths every year in the United States. And surgical adverse events are preventable and have a high incidence of correlation to these deaths that we see within the health system, within the hospital system. And so it's important that we start to find ways to improve patient care and to try to reduce the amount of errors that we see in, uh, in medicine. So why is this happening? Why is this so hard? What, what's, where, where does this all come from? And it, uh, we all know it. Anybody who's been through medical school, who's been through medical training, who's involved in medical training at the moment, knows the challenges of medical education, knows that to become a medical expert, you really have a very, very steep curve to become proficient at first, to become an expert, we'll say, in your lifetime, whatever that experience might be, in many aspects of care. Not only do we need to know the diagnosis of a disease process, how to evaluate that patient and do a medical exam, how to perform in the IR space procedures to treat certain disease processes, but we need to know how to be professionals, how to be in some worlds, managers to manage other people. Um, as a, an academic physician, I see my role as a manager. I have to know how to teach. I have to know how to educate um, and work with people at different levels and advance their knowledge so that they can become medical experts. How to collaborate with others. How do we work with our gastroenterologists, our transplant surgeons, our vascular surgeons, our vascular medicine doctors in different components of interventional radiology to understand what they can bring to the table, what we can bring to the table, that it, you know, these are all components of medical knowledge that we need to learn as part of our training. And so I always like to think that medical knowledge and training is as simple as let's study a book and let's learn some technical skills. 
those hard skills are easier to educate on the soft skills that I kind of just went out and talked about are much harder. But if you can't, it, it, without the expertise and the hard skills of technical and diagnosis, you won't be able to really become an expert in the soft skills either. And so talking about those technical skills, we need to create that expertise. And you know, if we don't have that expertise, we're gonna have higher complication rates to deal with and mortality rates to deal with. So what tools do we have to advance that knowledge? And you can think about it as active learning versus passive learning. And so active learning, if in analyses of what people gain from active versus passive, you remember 90% of what you do. So if you're doing a procedure, if you're practicing a procedure, if you're doing a technical um, work, that you're going to remember at a much greater degree than the 50% of what you see in here. So sitting in a lecture room, and all of us in our training programs have great schedules of lectures that go on weekly where you sit in a conference room and you have experts from your institution teaching you about different disease processes, different procedures you can perform. And we all know from all the time we spent in lectures in medical school, um, or I'm still of the day that they were in person, you guys probably are not, um, the, you remember only 50% of what you see in here. And you're only gonna remember 50% of what I say, but if you do it, if you go out and practice it, you're gonna remember a whole lot more. And that's where simulation has some clear benefits and advantages. Simulation is not just about technical skill, but you can do many other things with simulation. And I wanna drop this idea in your head that it's not just the technical, you need to get along with the technologists, the nursing staff in your room, the other providers, be them uh, APPs, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, trainees, and how to work as a part of a team to optimize the technical component of care for the patient, the procedural component of care for the patient, and patient management all together. And it takes communication as well as technical skill and teamwork. And really this is broken down because each one of these care teams function in silos. We're all different entities. The nurses in the room, the technologist in the room, the physicians in the room, all have different goals, different targets, different things they have to meet throughout each procedure. And that timeline and, and what they're doing um, during that procedure, they're paying attention to different pieces of information. And failed communication, ineffective interpersonal skills, interprofessional tension, meaning you know, the nurses don't respect the physicians or the physicians don't respect the technologists, can lead to poor dynamics and poor team interaction and different. And so you can end up losing that communication, so the optimal thing or the best thing is not being done for that patient. And that's what the silo mentality really is. And the Joint Commission is not happy about this and they're, they wanna try to improve this. And ways to improve this are through team training, through team events and simulation can be really at the center of that. So how does poor communication hurt? Why, does, why is Jayco really paying attention to this? Because poor communication was causative in two thirds of, uh, of medical errors. So in an analysis of 3000 serious medical errors, two thirds of those were communication based. And that's a really big deal. That's a, that's a big number. And it's always shocking to me because we focus so much on knowledge and training and technique, but it's these uh, soft skills of interpersonal communication that can play a really big role. Um, and you can see this uh, other data point here, 60 cases out of 444 were identified as involving communication breakdowns in that other analysis as well. What about technical skill? I think technical skill is still important. We all have to be able to perform the technical components of our job. We need to be able to know how to get ultrasound guided access to a challenging abscess in the pelvis transabdominally um, or how to recognize a collection versus other structures that are important that you don't want to traverse with your needle or with your drainage catheter or with your biopsy needle or whatever else that you're doing in the moment. Um, the data is really mostly in the surgical world. So fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery training programs produced higher performance scores for surgical residents performing lap coli. So if you do FLS, if you do simulation, you're gonna be better at doing in-person, in vivo procedures than if you don't do FLS training. Um, so here's hinting at the idea that non uh, low risk 
training in a simulated environment can improve the patient care um, and the technical skill of patient care very clearly. Competency-based proficiency, um, FLS simulator training was also associated with very high level skill retention at two years. So not only do you learn it right out of the gate, but you remember it after all is said and done, and that's important. Um, and then a Cochrane review of the effectiveness of VR training in laparoscopic surgery um, based on two, 23 trials and 622 participants confirmed the VR training decreased time taken, increased accuracy, and decreased errors. So again, technical skills improved by simulation-based training. What about other things? It's not, you know, laparoscopic surgery is one piece of information, is one component to what we're talking about. Um, but we don't do laparoscopic surgery. We don't do those types of procedures. So maybe colonoscopy and bronchoscopy are a little closer to endovascular procedures like we perform. So um, what is it, how do the simulation data look for colonoscopy and bronchoscopy? Well, colonoscopy simulator-based trained fellows were found to be safer, require less senior assistance, able to define endoscopic landmarks better, and to reach the cecum independently on more instances than traditionally trained fellows. So put somebody in a simulator, they can do the technical component better. Same with bronchoscopy. Improved performance for inexperienced trainees, doing basic bronchoscopy, excuse me, on patients compared to peers without that similar level of training. What about IR? What, is, what do we know in the IR world? So here's some great pictures of uh, when I was at Cornell uh, doing some simulator training with medical students with uh, phantoms. So ultrasound guided access can improve skills and get people comfortable for sure. Definitely get people interested in the field of interventional radiology. I would encourage people to look into this topic. There was a publication um, in techniques in vascular and interventional radiology, specifically on simulation and IR. And if you have interest in kind of how can simulation be done, um, there's great publications there on how to use high fidelity simulation, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, how to create low fidelity simulator models, like you can see in the pictures here on the cover of this um, journal issue, um, and how you can utilize that to implement um, real training for people and get more experience. And I think we have a long way to go from the innovation side. There's more that can be done in the innovation of simulator education. If it's high fidelity working with companies who provide high fidelity training, or if it's low fidelity models like this one. So Ben May, who was a former partner of mine, and I put this together and he wrote the article on that techniques issue. And we were we did some great work creating, this is an example of a nephrostomy model using very basic tools. So making a gel phantom at home in a bin and we used uh, sticks to make some rib shadow and then filled up a uh, sterile glove with saline so that we could bury that inside the gel phantom and make it look like a kidney that's dilated for nephrostomy and you can target getting access um, into that between the ribs, through the ribs, trying to get your ultrasound access, trying to target the mid pole of the calyx. Um, and so you can get a lot of practice using that. You can do some other kind of low fidelity simulators are pretty easy as well. Um, one of the things I built was this upper image over here is a wire exchange simulator. So I decided one of the things that we need to do all the time in IR is pin and pull exchanges. So backing a catheter out over a wire without losing access. Um, so we created this exchange fandom. Can you do this two-handed, two-handed with your dominant hand, two-handed with your non-dominant hand, one-handed with your dominant hand, one-handed with your non-dominant hand? Um, and you can practice, and I don't have it magged up, but there's a scoring algorithm taped up over here. So you wanna keep the wire in the center of this. And if you can keep it without moving from the center, it's no point added. And it's kind of like uh, the game of golf. So the, the higher your score, the worse you are. Um, so if you're a little further away, you get one. If you're a further, even further away, you get two. And you can kind of practice doing all of those. And we used to run some competitions for people to try to get the best score um, on their wire exchange simulator. Pretty easy to do something similar for filter placement and filter retrieval. Um, here's a model that we worked with in the past, and we set up PVC pipe that's clear plastic, and 
we would deploy an IVC filter and then we would use a snare to retrieve that IVC filter. And in order to model something that I think is a little bit challenging that um, is part of IR training, we used cameras to make it simple. We didn't want to use fluoroscopy. We didn't want radiation exposure. So instead we used overhead cameras above that clear uh, PVC pipe so that you could project it onto a screen nearby. So you are simulating the idea of using your hands to control tools when you're not looking at your hands, when you're looking up at the screen, which is another skill set that we assume is easy to take on in interventional radiology, but is something people need to learn with time and experience. Then you can bounce into the high fidelity world of simulation. So this is an example of the Mentis simulator um, shown here. They are, there are two high fidelity simulation companies out there. One is Mentis, one is uh, 3D Systems. They both create these high fidelity models that have optical uh, sensors. There's three optical sensors inside this uh, cage right here on the table. As you advance devices through the sheath at the back, it will tolerate up to three things that it will sense. So you could put in your base wire, an 035 wire, then you can put in a five French catheter. Then through that five French catheter, you can then put in a microsystem and it will detect each of those systems at different points and project them onto the monitor right here. And so you're able to create different cases. Um, they partner with industry to create a lot of these modules. And so they have these modules available um, for learning and education and experience. And they're a great company from an innovation perspective to work with. Um, to expand their repertoire of tools that they have out there to expand the number of cases that you may be able to um, offer or utilize in the system. Some of the stuff here, what's publicly available. So you can see a lot of peripheral arterial disease cases where you can do angioplasty, you can do uh, coil embolization, um, there's prostate artery embolization, there's uh, trauma bleeds, there's hepatic arterial embolization that they call TACE. Um, you can do uterine artery embolization, if I didn't mention that already. And then they do a lot with cardiology so that you can see a lot of cardiac cases here. There's also intracranial work that they have access to. Um, they've done a lot that uh, they've worked with from an innovation side where you can upload live and real cases into the system. So they have a portal where you can take CTA data and mix that and merge that into the system. So if you want to do practice, pre-procedure practice, let's say, in certain cases, uh, some of the EVAR, TVAR, it's available at the moment. You can actually load a live case and then practice and do that particular patient in advance of the uh, procedure so you can improve your skill set, know your expectation, hasten your procedure time, um, and, and hopefully have better outcomes. So the, this all sounds great. It sounds really exciting. It sounds like something we should all be doing. It sounds like the model that you know makes a whole lot of sense. Let's practice. Let's do the best we can with our patients and reduce the risk. Well, what's the data for the vascular world? So simulation training with an ultrasound phantom showed significant improvement in technical skill acquisition. Um, Patient-specific rehearsal in 10 patients undergoing EVAR resulted in subjective benefit for optimal C-arm angulation as well as technical and team performance. And then if they, they looked at, another study looked at 16 vascular surgery trainees before and after simulation-based training, and they showed decreased procedure time, 56 minutes versus 77, um, and an improved Likert scale of procedure performance, meaning the person performing the procedure felt more confident and comfortable with the procedure, uh, the ones who did the simulation than those who did not. And then I think even more, and probably the best piece of data that's on this slide, fewer endoleaks in the simulation uh, group versus the non-simulation group. And so when we're looking at data, when we're looking at how good is simulation at improving our outcomes, we really wanna evaluate these different, in the diagram on the right, the different points of validity, base validity, content validity, construct validity, concurrent validity, or predictive validity. And that's really going to be the data that we want to walk away with. That's going to tell us how well are we doing? How good is simulation at replicating real life? How good is it at, um, as a training tool? How good is it at differentiating skill levels um, and telling somebody they're an expert or not? Can we use this for 
um, expertise training uh, or confirmation of skills so that people can get a credential saying they are, you know, an endovascular or certified physician of some sort. Um, so that's where we're going. So at our institution at Jefferson, uh, we formed a collaboration with Mentis um, and we're working to create some of this data in the endovascular space, in the interventional radiology space, and try to push this point of data forward. And so right now we got a local funding grant um, within the institution to do a randomized trial essentially of education using traditional education versus traditional education plus endovascular simulation. So much like you've seen in the FLS model and the bronchoscopy model and the colonoscopy model um, in the ultrasound guided puncture model, let's mimic those in vas endovascular simulation using high fidelity. Um, and so we took naive medical students, we took first year medical students and we put them into the two groups and we basically gave them education, the same education on transarterial chemoembolization, on liver embolization. And then we had some observe a liver embolization procedure and we had the other half perform simulated training and hands-on simulation with for transarterial chemoembolization in the liver. Um, and we wanted to assess procedural knowledge acquisition. So we test them at baseline, tested them after. We wanted to assess technical proficiency. How good did they do on the procedure? And we wanted to assess self-perceived procedural competence. How did these trainees improve afterwards? What did they think of their competence? What did they think of their knowledge acquisition between one group and the other? So as a hypothesis for the size, for the idea of how do you determine how to uh, lay out a research model, um, traditional education plus endovascular simulation will result in increased procedural knowledge acquisition, technical proficiency, and self-perceived confidence compared to traditional education. So we think we're going to do better in these three realms. So this is how we tested um, these three realms of data. So we wanted to, to, to test basic IR knowledge. So we asked questions about what sized guide wire would you use? What guide catheter would you use to get into the celiac artery, name the catheter, show the catheter? Because these are all skills that you're gonna need to learn over time, especially in the early phases. And remember, we're taking procedure naive subjects, people who have no background in IR. And then we wanted to ask about the taste procedure itself. So can, can you organize these steps A through I in order of what comes first and, and each step that you do one by one? Because um, you're going to have to walk through those steps and know what they are, and the simulator may be able to provide that piece of information or give you that information or help you walk through that information um, faster or become more knowledgeable and make it easier to remember. Um, we wanted to test what type of embolic material are you going to use? What are you going to ask your tech to give you in order to perform this procedure? We wanted to tech, um, knowledge of anatomy. So we put this uh, celiac arteriogram model up and wanted people to name the different arteries um, that are pointed out through by the letters. Um, we also asked questions about interpretation. Where do you see the hypervascular tumor? What is going on? And then knowledge. Um, what did you learn? What do you know about transarterial chemoembolization? Do you know about indications? Do you know about um, blood supply and how it's provide, how it's supported or what what the primary blood supply is and why we're targeting the arterial system. Um, what are contraindications and what type of different techniques can be utilized? So here's our results. I think it's, it's uh, interesting data. This is not public, publicized yet, um, but we did get improved procedure knowledge with simulation. So the performance on that exam that I just showed um, was significantly better in the simulated group than the traditional education group. Interestingly, and I think this is kind of fascinating, the rest of it was the same. So as far as gaining more interest in the in the interventional radiology, having more clinical understanding about the procedure, procedure understanding, procedure competence, all of those things were the same, regardless of your uh, exposure, be it 
real world, real life or simulation. And so that's positive. That means that both groups are gonna get the things they need, but simulation is gonna improve the knowledge at least immediately of those questions that we're asking, some of the data points that we think are critically important to understanding the procedure. So to conclude, and, and I know this was kind of a, a quick talk and we can get into some questions. You know, simulation is a technique, not a technology. It's, to re it's not to replace, but to amplify real experiences with guided experiences and offer immersive in nature that immersive experiences that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of real world in a fully interactive fashion. So we need to do better and we need to supplement what we're doing already when it comes to training for interventional techniques and simulation could be a fantastic tool to continue to supplement that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that. Um, that was very interesting, Ron. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can um, type them down in the Q&A section. Um, I guess, Ron, I will ask a question. Um, do you know how much the, the Mentis machine costs by any chance? I don't know if Mentis would want me to uh, share that information. Um, okay. <laughs> it, you know, it, it can be, it's definitely a costly endeavor from a hospital side of things that okay. you said, um, you know, purchasing from a hospital, we can have a whole talk about purchasing, um, but purchasing from a hospital side of things can be a challenging endeavor um, all mm -hmm. in all, because depending on your hospital system and your health system, people look at things as a cost benefit analysis. So when you're outlaying kind of large capital amounts, let's say for equipment, usually you're looking for a return on investment. And so the hospital system is gonna look at it and say, okay, if I buy this and it costs me, let's just pick a random number, $250,000 for this piece of equipment. And I can bill every time I use it, $10,000. We know, excuse me, we know that you need to do so many procedures to get to that 250 and make, and everything over that's profit. When you're purchasing one of these, it's a little more complicated. So you may say, okay, it's gonna cost me that amount of money, but I'm gonna reduce my procedure time by 50%. And that reduced procedure time may allow me to do one extra procedure per day. That one extra procedure per day is gonna get you the return on investment. Or if you're in, at an academic institution, like I have worked in my whole career, you know, from a teaching perspective, from an education perspective, there's a lot you can do from a coursework standpoint that you can run coursework that can pay for those budgets. So yes, they're costly, but I will say that the simulator companies and Mentis, who I know very well, are very engaged in trying to get this information out and get these resources out for, for public use. And the more they partner, they're partnering with industry and industry is becoming kind of a great utilization tool where they bring these simulators in and let's say they wanna run an RFS hands-on training um, for Venus stenting and BARD has a simulated Venus stent program um, using the Mentis system. They'll bring in five or six and run a simulated hands-on training. So that's that's probably a lot of how this happens. It looks like we have a question. Um, are there any non-virtual high fidelity models that IR trainees can practice techniques on? Non-virtual high fidelity models that IR trainees can practice techniques on. Um, I'd say once you break out of these kind of virtual environments, um, I think you're looking at more of the low fidelity world only just because it costs a lot to build these things. Like we were just saying, the, the tech that it takes to create a model, um, to create a simulation event um, with a computer or with a simulated tool, or maybe it's AI, um, you know, these things are 
kind of high fidelity at nature. You can create really nice, more complicated models that aren't necessarily quote unquote high fidelity. So there's lots of flow systems that you can use that are kind of low fidelity where you can have a flow model that's made of uh, gelatin phantom. You can run saline through it and you can advance wires catheters and it can be a model. And many places have these where there's a model of the celiac, the splenic, left gastric, the arterial system that you can basically go in with a base catheter, use um, micro catheters, micro wires to catheterize an area where there might be an aneurysm or get into the hepatic parenchyma and inject things or deploy coils in those, in those territories. So I don't know, I, I call those low fidelity just because they're not um, so computer generated and high fidelity and made from real models of real patients, but they're higher than let's say a gel phantom that you're making in your, in your kitchen. The low cost uh, nephrostomy glove simulation looks pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, that one's a really fun one to utilize. I think that's one of my favorite models, which is why I like to put it in these slides because especially you can make, every time you make it, you can make it a little different. Um, so we added the rib shadows to try to make it harder as we were making it. Um, it the initial model that uh, Dr. May built was kind of just a gel phantom with, for biopsy. And then he came up with the idea of, well, could we make a vascular structure? Could we, could we fill gloves and bury it in there and try to make it look like a kidney and it worked. And then that was a little too easy. So then we were like, could we add ribs to make the, the ultrasound window harder? And so you can kind of, you can be really creative with these things. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions. So. Um, I guess we will call it at this point. Thank you very much for <laughs> uh, doing this, Ron. It's a, it was a pleasure to host you, and um, we look forward to uh, further, um, you know, groundbreaking things in the world of simulation. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Coming. Thanks a lot. All right, have a good night, everyone.